So, welcome everybody to Biostock Live from Stockholm. Uh, I'm introducing in English today because we will be broadcasting this in the US as well uh, for the benefit for our American uh, friends. And um, today we have a theme, Immune Oncology, which is uh, probably the hottest area within drug uh, development today. We have with us today four very exciting and innovative companies who we will be presenting. Um, Immunovia, Cantaria, Rovac and Alligator Bioscience. And uh, with no further ado, I would like to introduce you to the first presenter, which is Mats Gran, CEO of Immunovia. Welcome Mats. Thank you. <coughs> well, Immunovia is certainly an immune oncology company, but we do not use the immune system to uh, treat the drug therapy. Uh, we do um, use the immune system to uh, detect disease early, to detect cancer early, because finding the cancer early is actually the, the best way to, to, uh, to improve the care. So uh, the company is um, is uh, founded on the uh, ability to measure what goes on in the immune system because the immune system is the first to, to react when you do catch a disease such as cancer or autoimmunity. Uh, and what we have is the ability to measure many proteins at the same time, proteins that are part of or related to the immune system, to the immune response to a disease. So when the disease is detected by the immune system in, in the body, we can measure a change in the immune system and find that, that signal from the immune system itself, which is a way to find it very, very early. And we do that by measuring many proteins at the same time, finding a fingerprint in the, in the pattern of proteins, uh, meaning that uh, uh, you have all of you some 20,000 different proteins circulating in your blood, and many of these are related to the immune system or part of the immune system. And it has a certain pattern relative concentration of the proteins when you're healthy. And when you catch a disease, somewhere in that landscape of proteins, there is a change like a fingerprint. Uh, and that is the one we can detect with our technology. So um, how do we do this? Well, to measure proteins, one needs something called antibodies. Antibodies are molecules that uh, bind, that catch uh, uh, proteins very specifically. Only one type of protein is ca caught by one type of one uh, antibody. And we have an, have a, have an asset uh, uh, when it comes to the antibodies because this is a library of antibodies developed specifically to, uh, to uh, <coughs> be stable on, on this plastic surface. And this has been a problem to create this type of platforms in history, but now we have one that is extremely stable over time, thanks to the work done by, by uh, Professor Carl Barbeck and his team at Lund University. So this is a unique feature for our technology called the Imbray platform, that we have antibodies that, that can be printed on the surface, <coughs> and we can print many of them, up to 2,000 antibodies per square centimeter, and measure very many proteins at the same time. So when we have produced this, uh, this uh, plastic piece with many antibodies on, we do um, use uh, standard blood samples and we do then compare uh, when we develop a new test um, uh, blood from, from the healthy and the deceased, if that's the clinical question. Uh, and uh, we do that using four to five hundred different antibodies. And then we have very advanced bioinformatics software to find out which ones in this uh, large amount of, of markers actually are needed to, uh, to answer the question, do, does this person uh, have a disease or is he, is he healthy? So this is the whole platform. It's uh, about 16, 17 years of research in, in, in one minute here. So the assets, the antibody uh, platform, uh, antibodies, which without this wouldn't work, very uh, proprietary uh, and advanced bioinformatics to find out which ones are required for the actual product. And that normally ends up between 20 and 40 of these four or 500 that we use in, in the research mode. Then using uh, the technology, uh, commercially, it's a rather straightforward process uh, in, the, in the clinical laboratory. Using a standard blood sample from the patient, putting on uh, fluorescent markers to, to the proteins in the blood and then applying it to the product, <coughs> to the chip. And we can have 14 different blood samples on the same uh, slide. The slide is then read with a standard fluorescence scanner 
and creating a picture. That picture is uploaded to uh, Imanova service and in servers and interpreted with our uh, uh, software, uh, creating, uh, in, in this case that we're going to talk about today, uh, yes, no, uh, do you have cancer or do you not, in terms of pancreatic cancer, which is our first product going to market. So it doesn't require any new instrumentation that's not already on the market, uh, but it does require, of course, our uh, chip with antibodies on and our um, um, interpretation software. So our first product is to detect pancreatic cancer early. And the reason we did choose this, this uh, disease was obviously we had good results, but also it's in, in a very large clinical need. There is nothing out there to find pancreatic cancer early. And today's situation is that it's actually the third most common uh, cancer in terms of mortality. How many people actually die in absolute number per year? It did pass breast cancer a couple of years ago in US specifically. So it's number three when it comes to number of people dying. These are the US figures from 2016. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not the most common cancer, but it's number three in terms of mortality and it's moving up, whereas uh, the, the mortality in other cancers are decreasing. So the five year survival is very low. It's five to eight percent dependent on country. And this is due to that the cancer in, in the pancreas is detected late uh, since there are no or very vague symptoms in the early stages when it's treatable. So most people are actually found when, when the cancer is not treatable anymore. However, if it could be found in stage one, the first stage of cancer, you could get an, an survival with current uh, treatment, which is surgery. Um, in, uh, in, of 50, up to 50% instead of 5 to 80%. So early detection is very important and that's the reason we we, we gone for, for this uh, application first. So looking at the different stages of this cancer, as I said, the difference of being found in, in the later stages is, is uh, for going from 5 to 50% survival chance if it could be found here. However, today uh, about 80% of people who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer are unfortunately in a non-treatable stage and the medium survival in Europe is 4.6 months after diagnosis. So the only hope really in, in this cancer is, is uh, early detection. Uh, so that has an incredible impact on the, on the outcome whether you can find it in this stage or, or late. So we have done very large retrospective studies on biobanks containing blood samples from people with cancer and healthy and so forth. And we have shown in thousands of patients that we can find the stage one and two uh, cancers uh, with about 96% accuracy. And this is just to <coughs> illustrate that the red ones are the cancer people people with cancer and, and blue ones with, we are, are healthy. And, and our technology can distinguish between these ones uh, and telling who has the cancer and who has not. Um, going to market now with this, this, this test. Um, the cancer is not so common that you can screen or test everybody uh, once a year or so forth. That is not possible to defend from a health economic point of view. But there are certain groups that have higher risk than others to acquire the cancer and, and these uh, ones are, are <coughs> our target. Today when you do get late symptoms the tools that are available for the clinicians are imaging endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, this is the invasive version that you go down in the body. Not very pleasant but it's uh, a tool used and it's magnet, uh, uh, MRI. Uh, it's uh, uh, CT uh, um, and it's endosco endo endoscopy or these ones in combination and so the results today is about 80-85% cannot be treated. Our goal is to make sure that people come much earlier to, uh, to the current uh, tree uh, of, of treatment. Not to change the practice but to make sure that people come much earlier here because the surgeons need to know where to cut anyway. Uh, for imaging. So the risk groups we're looking at is, is the ones that have uh, a familiar or hereditary uh, uh, higher risk, meaning that you have uh, close relatives that have died of pancreatic cancer. If you have several ones uh, of your close relatives that had pancreatic cancer, two, three, your risk may be up to 30 times higher than normal. Not 30%, 30 times. 
So this is a very, um, uh, of course, obvious group and the people are very aware because their close relatives have, have died and they know that they are in the risk zone themselves. This is about 200,000 patients in Europe and US. Uh, they need testing twice a year with a blood sample uh, from say 45 and, and lifelong. So that's a very interesting group for us because they are very aware of, of the disease. Okay. Then in the total of people getting pancreatic cancer, 90% uh, are not hereditary, so 90 are sporadic, 10% are approximately coming from the hereditary group. So how to address the big chunk, the, the 90%? Well, one uh, uh, trigger is actually that it has been found in the last, last years, in the last five, six years, it's been very uh, uh, large uh, investigations that um, if you are over 50 and you get your first diagnosis of diabetes, then you have an eight to, to tenfold increased risk that it's actually pancreatic cancer. Close to 1% of the over 50 uh, with first diagnosis of diabetes actually get pancreatic cancer within three years after the diabetes diagnosis. So it's definitely a, a group worth checking up. These ones do not need to be uh, uh, monitored lifelong, but only for three years. Because if, it hasn't, uh, if you haven't developed cancer after three years, it, it's uh, normal type 2 diabetes. So, but it's a big group. It's three million, more than three million new people every year in Europe and US that, that do get uh, diabetes after 50 for the first time. So, so that's a very large group uh, and very interesting for us, of course, to, to utilize. Then there's a third uh, clinical use of it, and that is that people actually do often have vague symptoms in the early stages as well. But when you come to, and they do visit uh, primary care, Vortrantral and these ones, uh, the, the problem is that these symptoms are, are very general. It means indigestion, mid-back pain, um, pain on eating, fatigue, it can be anything really. So their primary care sends them off to specialists in the hospital, but for other suspicions. Then, that's of course, the ones who actually have cancer they don't find that disease, so they come back after a while to the primary care and go back and forth. And the Brits have investigated this very, very carefully, how it works in the, in the whole care. And it can be up to 18 uh, visits to a doctor before you get the right diagnosis for the one who actually had cancer. This takes at least six to nine months in average. The problem is that in six to nine months you can move from treatable to non-treatable for the ones who actually have cancer. So there are large efforts going on in Scandinavia, UK and US predominantly to decrease this time radically by using, um, giving the tools to the primary care to, to, to risk, increase the number of people who actually should get diagnosed much earlier and send them to something called diagnostic centers. These centers absolutely need a blood test because they can't do imaging on everyone who comes there. So we work with some, some large institutes in UK and, and, and other places using our tests um, uh, for that purpose as well. So uh, that's, that's the market we are going for. How to get there is, is very important to win the key opinion leaders. These are the most important uh, pancreologists or people specialists uh, on, on the pancreas cancer in the world. So we have built a key opinion leader network working with us of predominantly uh, the ones that have an influence on national guidelines. Uh, national guidelines is, is to, to set the standards for a country how to handle a certain disease. So we work, for example, uh, uh, with um, the US woman called Margaret Tempira had, headed, uh, heading the U, U, San Francisco gastro uh, part, but she's the chairman of the US uh, committee that sets the guidelines for pancreatic cancers. That's one of our key opinion leaders. That's the type of, of network we have built up there. And why do we need them? First of all, they are the first customers themselves. Secondly, they do influence all other um, all other uh, potential buyers in, in, the in the health community. Even more important, they are actually advisors to the payers, the um, insurance systems and insurance companies that pay uh, uh, for, for the test later on or takes decision. They are also involved with the patient organizations. So if you don't have the key opinion leaders with you, everything else falls apart. So this is extremely important in, in the market uh, access program. All right, so we also do something called prospective studies, and that is to use the uh, 
test as it's supposed to be used in these three different risk groups I talked about. And prospective studies in diagnostics is very different from what the other guys will talk about in therapeutics. Predominantly the uh, prospective studies in diagnostics done to give material for um, documentation and, and usage uh, uh, of the test uh, so that the insurance companies will take the decisions to pay for it. It's not to get the right to sell because that you do get on, on, on the retrospective material and other documentation. So it's a different process for diagnostics which is simpler than for, for pharma but it's still important with prospective studies using it as it's supposed to be used and that is to get paid. So we run three large uh, retrospective studies. One for this first familiar group and there we are done running a multi-center study ongoing with centers in US. Uh, United Kingdom, Spain and Sweden. Uh, Saul Grinska is, is the involved in Sweden and several centers in US. And so this is um, a multi-center study with many centers involved because uh, each center has a limited number of familiar people they meet anyway regularly every year. So we tap onto the ongoing program to get the recruitment easier to the program. So, so that's one study important for us and we expect to have an interim readout of this one during uh, next year, early next year. Then we have the new onset diabetics. This is the big one. Um, and here we have recently a press release that we are starting actually the world's largest study in this area prospectively uh, with the support of the Swedish state in form of Swe Life and uh, Region Skåne and Region Uppsala will provide uh, 6,000 patients uh, to this study for us. Very good. We have also uh, a letter of intent with Denmark through an organization called DD2, which is funded largely by Novo Nordisk, that they will add another 3,500 patients. So we will have close to 10,000 patients only in Scandinavia, and that is what's needed for that study. We are also working to add a, a US part of that one because of market reasons. Uh, for this last one, the uh, vague symptoms or uh, early symptoms, we have a pilot study started at uh, University College London, which is um, running a pilot for, for the health authorities in the UK, covering about 6 million people in northern London uh, and 800 primary care stations where we get the patients from for that one. So all these ones will provide results that we will use to finally get um, uh, payment from, from the insurance organizations. That's the purpose of this. So how big is the market? Well, looking at these three groups, the hereditary risk group is um, uh, uh, 200,000 patients, two tests per year. We do predict about 500 euros per test, and that will mean a, a market of 200 million euro, 2 billion Swedish for this group. Uh, the, the high risk group of diabetics, uh, uh, 3, under 3 million new patients every year. If we calculate low with one test per patient per, per two, two years, ideally it should be two tests per year for three years, but let's, let's be conservative. It's still a market potential of, of 3 uh, billion euros. Uh, and the high early symptoms group, approximately 1 million tests per year used needed in Europe and US, uh, and that would be a half a billion euro. A very, very important and, and large market we are addressing here at full penetration. So where are we? Well, uh, we have done the retrospective studies. We are finishing these ones. We are working with lots with the formal accreditations of various kinds for US and Europe. Uh, and when this is uh, um, achieved at the end of this year, we will start what we call self-pay uh, sales, selling to people and organizations that pay uh, without reimbursement, without uh, insurance pay. And that is, is what, we, uh, what we're going for at the end of this year. In the meantime, we are doing the prospective studies leading to, uh, to reimburse sales uh, at the end of 2020 approximately. So our um, guidance is that we uh, have a goal to reach a turnover at the end of the self-pay period of 250 to 300 million Swedish. And uh, two years after the reimbursement decision, uh, we are predicting that we will be able to reach somewhere in 800 to 1 billion Swedish crowns in, in turnover. That's our guidelines that we have released. Finally, a few words about the pipeline as well. As you see, this technology is general in the sense that we measure the immune response to disease. So we have some very interesting early results in, in autoimmunity. And autoimmunity is a disease where the immune system itself is, is attacking the, the body. And there are actually over 100 different types of autoimmune disorders, but there are some generic uh, needs in the, in, the, in the healthcare 
The first one, number one here, is that get the correct diagnosis early. It's very difficult uh, for certain situations for the clinicians, rheumatologists, to set the right diagnosis because the symptoms are overlapping between the diseases. So there can be a long time between onset of, of disease and, and actually the correct diagnosis. If you have the wrong diagnosis, you get the wrong treatment, which is not good. So that's an area we are important for us. We are also looking at number three here, and that is that most of these ones do. It's a chronic disease. You don't you have it your whole life once you got it, but it goes and comes. Sometimes it's it's inactive, and sometimes it gets active, called flares, skov in Swedish. Uh, and monitoring when and predicting when a flare will happen is is really important for uh, for the clinicians. So that's where we are. So. It's a, why do we do it? It's a large volume market. Total uh, uh, market is three and a half billion US. You can split it in two different parts where we focus on what's called systemic, uh, where these diseases uh, fit in, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, lupus. And that market is four and a half billion. We go for, for this one. So we have great results at the first studies uh, uh, selecting SLE patients out of a mix of the rest ones with 96% accuracy. And, and then you can, of course, pick the other ones as well. So this is forms our basis. We are doing complementary and additional retrospective studies. This year we have got big biobanks in the house from, from Linköping University Hospital. And we will get results during the year that will determine our final product strategy in this area. So finally, Focus on getting the pancreas cancer test to market this year, end of this year, by fin finishing the accreditation and the regulatory and production scale, and then expand the autoimmunity program. And our end goal is always getting paid for reimbursement and become the national guideline globally for pancreatic cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Mats. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, like you said, going towards the market uh, and reimbursement is key. Yes. Uh, what would you say is the, the main challenge that you're facing as to that aspect? To that aspect. Well, um, reimbursement systems, I mean, payer systems are different per country. You know, US, you have, have a situation where the um, uh, federal the state systems, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, cover about 50 to 60 percent of the population. Then you have, have a number of large private insurance companies, but in total it's actually around almost 100 different insurance companies. And mm -hmm. you have to, to have a good strategy of who you uh, convince in which order and things like that. And, and use local advisors with, with long, strong influence. Uh, when it comes to Europe, you cannot. You you get the permission to sell in Europe uh, centrally through a C mark and, and uh, accreditations according to ISO standards. So that is straightforward, although it's a lot of work. But it's straightforward. But to get paid is different per country. And in certain countries, it's different per region. Not to mention Sweden, where the decisions are somewhere in in these 21 mm. different landings and so forth. Yeah. So so it's uh, you have to have a strategy per country basically, and you have mm. to have local knowledge where you get in. Yeah, and. Uh, this is a process that will take some time. What are the alternatives? Uh, I mean, so if, if a patient really wants yes. this. That's why we start self-pay. And, and uh, uh, you can, as soon as you have the accreditations, you're allowed to, to in, in, in diagnostics, to, to deliver the test uh, result based on, on people or health organizations paying out of their current budgets. And mm. it, the rule of thumb is that you can reach approximately 5% of the US market in that way which is significant and that's what we introduce and it's starting to get uh, possible uh, through various channels in, in, in Europe as well, most European countries. So that's what we are going to do first and what everybody in diagnostics does, of course, uh, going this way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had a busy 2017. Yes. Um, it will probably be a busy 2018 as well. Even more so. What, what are you personally looking forward to the most this year? Sales start. Sales start. Sales start. First invoice, paid. <laughs> <laughs> Not sent, but paid. Paid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Much uh, better than uh, sent. I'm going to turn to the audience to see if anyone here has a question. It's okay to to post a question in Swedish, and we can translate it. 
any competitive actions? Right. Um, well, uh, when we started this uh, and decided strategically to go for pancreatic cancer, uh, we were way ahead of most, most others and we still are ahead. But uh, the, in the meantime, pancreatic cancer has risen to the surface, to put it nicely, because uh, for, for several reasons. The US uh, even put a law in place that the National Cancer Institute of this has to focus on pancreatic cancer. So the academic money for pancreatic cancer has increased tremendously, meaning that there are many publications coming out. But these are all in the early stages. Yeah? So, so there are many interesting approaches, but they are very early stage there. Then there is a, a, a general interest in early detection and many large initiatives on the commercial side and investments specifically in the US. And they all use, I mean, the obvious example, uh, the biggest challenge is pancreatic cancer because it's the worst situation. So many large companies or large, not large companies maybe, but the large, largely funded new companies are focusing on this or at least saying they are. Uh, we still uh, are pretty confident that we are ahead, both time-wise and, and definitely on the result side, the accuracy. But it is a race, so uh, and there's no reason to stand still. That's clear. I think we have time for one more I'm question. I'm curious, uh, do you use the same MURA chip for autoimmune disease as for the cancer? Yeah. We, we do, um, as I said, when we do discovery work, the first studies of a new, new thing, uh, we use about four, between four and five hundred different antibodies. And most of them are actually the same between different diseases because they measure the response from the immune system. But we do add always some specific ones that are more related. For pancreatic cancer, there are certain uh, markers that are related to cancer. So we add these ones as well where we do that. So we do some some modifications, but uh, the 90% or something is the same because it's the immune response. So in that sense, it's a very efficient um, process, both in the discovery mode and, and of course in the production mode, because the pancreatic case is not only bringing a test to market, it's also building the whole infrastructure for bringing out tests on this platform, you know? Because a new test will be the same, in, except there will be other antibodies on the, on the final chip. So the platform is, is uh, in that sense, extremely scalable. If that answers your questions, and a little bit more. more or less. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Mats, you will be grilled uh, by Biosox analyst in a few moments uh, in a separate interview. Yeah. Uh, we thank you so much for coming today with a warm applause. Thanks, you. And that means that we are ready to present our next speaker, which is Jaren Forsberg of Cantalia. Welcome, Jaren. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be here. And uh, I think it's actually a very good uh, introduction by Mats and Imanovia here, because now they basically explained how, how we're going to find patients, and now the next step is how can we treat the patients. And uh, Cantalia is 100% focused on finding new treatments of cancer using the immune system and trying to work at some more fundamental aspects of the cancer development in our design of new drugs. Uh, so, so I'd like to start with some data that were presented in August last year by Novartis, but I think they are very important and very important to put Cantargia on the scene. Uh, Novartis uh, has a drug called canakinumab, which is already registered for autoimmune diseases and inflammatory diseases. And as a next step in their product development, Novartis did a study in cardiovascular disease patients, a major study, it was more than 10,000 patients. And uh, cardiovascular disease is not really our focus, it's cancer. But what they discovered as a side finding was that this drug actually reduced the risk of lung cancer with 67% and the risk of dying in lung cancer with 77%. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that Cantargia's lead project is similar to, to Novartis' drug, but we see some obvious uh, advantages, and I will explain that in more detail. And, uh, I can assure you that Novartis is taking these results very seriously. So Novartis uh, is now starting three different phase three trials in non-small cell lung cancer, which is the most common form of lung cancer. And uh, starting three phase three trials is a major undertaking. Uh, and 
also to just to explain why they observed this decrease in lung cancer was that in cardiovascular disease patients uh, smoking is a risk factor and smoking is also a risk factor for lung cancer so that's the link why we could observe so, so many cases. Uh, they also discovered that uh, other forms of cancers the risk were reduced uh, not as much as lung cancer but still reduced. They also noticed that several autoimmune diseases the risk got reduced so arthritis, osteoarthritis and gout. Uh, and then looking into this system what is uh, Novartis drug doing and what is our drug doing. So one of the systems that are driving cancer is called the IL-1 system, interleukin-1 system. Uh, there are two forms in the blood that signals to cancer cells to basically tell the cancer cells to do something horrible to the body. One is called interleukin-1 alpha and one is called interleukin-1 beta and they signal through what's called the receptor, IL-1 receptor. Uh, what canakinumab does is that it's taking away IL-1 beta from the blood but IL-1 alpha is still in the tumor and can signal so they do not shut down the system completely, it's only a partial shutdown. What Cantargia instead is doing <coughs> is blocking one of the components in the receptor called IL-1 RAP and thereby signals from both IL-1 alpha and IL-1 beta are blocked. Uh, what I should also mention is that in this very potent system, Cantarga has a patent on IL-1 RAP as a target for antibody therapy in general, which means that uh, we have another strength here. Uh, also, since we are developing an antibody therapy, uh, antibodies are, they are like some kind of crayfish and the claws are designed to recognize things that are, let's say, uh, foreign or unwanted. And IL-1 wrap is recognized by the claws. But the tail of this crayfish is designed to stimulate immune systems to come and kill cells uh, expressing uh, something unwanted. So actually, we both block this system and we stimulate the immune system to kill cancer cells. So we have what's called a dual or a double mechanism of action. Uh, and then we've been looking at so how, ma how many patients can actually be treated and how many patients actually overexpress this antigen. And in non-small cell lung cancer it's about 80% of the patients. In pancreatic cancer it's about 70%. But we found it in a large number of different cancer forms like breast cancer, colorectal cancer, melanoma, leukemia. But uh, Cantarga has decided to go for non-small cell lung cancer and pancreatic cancer because there are lots of patients, there is a big medical need and this type of biology is really supporting us to go here. So then looking at the corporate part of Cantarga, uh, we recently raised 232 million Swedish which means that we have uh, financing for until at least mid 2020 and we have a very ambitious program in front of us and it's, this program is now fully financed which is good. We have a very strong owners. We have a, a Danish VC fund called Sunstone being the biggest owner having 9% of the company. It's followed by a number of various funds like Swedish pension funds, first AP fund, fourth AP fund, second AP fund. Uh, another fund called Nordic Cross which is here's SA, under SAB and we have uh, Handelsbanken, Lekmels Fund, Pharmaceutical Fund also investing and then we have a number of local people from the sou southern Sweden who has been part of Cantargia investment consortium since the start. Uh, our market cap today is slightly above half a billion Swedish which is about 65 million US and we're traded on Nasdaq First North at the moment. We have communicated that we are, have started a process to be listed on the main market. That process is ongoing according to plan and we, we have 
ticked off a few boxes. We have, for instance, changed accounting system to IFRS. Uh, our pipeline, we have two different projects. We have CAN04, which is our main project, a cancer project for non-small cell lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. Uh, it is in clinical trials, so-called phase one part of a phase one slash two A trial. Uh, we expect to have a first results uh, during summer this year. Uh, we also know that we have potential in other cancers and we have strong preclinical data on that. Uh, we have not exactly how decided when and how we will expand into new indications. Uh, we also have a second program in preclinical phase, which again supported by Novartis data, uh, showed that certain autoimmune diseases are triggered by this uh, biological system. And if we can block it, we can also have an effect on autoimmune inflammatory diseases. Come back to that a little bit. Uh, and then, this is just a little bit of biology, but our view on cancer has changed very much, and this is very relevant to Cantargia. Uh, 20 years ago, we had a very simple view of what was causing cancer. We basically, the community thought that if we get a cell that is damaged and start to divide uh, uncontrolled, you get cancer. Today we know that that's not really the whole story. It's more complicated than that. You actually need something else. And you can regard this as some kind of seed and soil. If you want to have a good harvest of something, it's not enough to just have seed and spread it. You need s the seed needs somewhere to grow. And that's where this new view comes up that you need an inflammatory microenvironment around the tumor cells, and thereby they get protected from the immune system and they get the nutrients and they can grow. So to get cancer you need both damaged cells and inflammatory microenvironment. And what Cantarga is doing is attacking this inflammatory tumor microenvironment to basically lock in the cancer cells. And, and this can for instance be viewed in non-small cell lung cancer where if you smoke, you know, you have an increased risk of getting lung cancer. And the, risk, the reason why smoking is so dangerous is that it's both damaging cells and at the same time it's inducing an inflammation around these damaged cells. So thereby it's very cancerogenic. And it's, you can follow this, uh, so this is just lung tissue and you can see the surface of, of lung tissue here which is a normal lung, and then once it develops towards cancer, you can see that it becomes brown here, and the brown is the tumor inflammation, which uh, we are trying to, let's say, counteract. Uh, we have looked in various forms of animal models for non-small cell lung cancer. We know that we can get a reduction in growth of lung cancer models in mice. Uh, we have demonstrated before that when we do this, we actually get the immune system to attack uh, th these tumors. And you can see that we, you get lots of brown staining, which is what's called natural killer cells, which is exactly what we want to get into the tumor to get rid of the tumor cells. And this is part of our double mechanism of action. But what we presented as a press release uh, two weeks ago and one week ago was that we are going to present completely new data at the world's biggest cancer research conference called American Association of Cancer Research, uh, which is, will be held in Chicago in April. And what we do here is that we can show that we also not only attack the tumor cells, but we also block their ability to form metastasis and metastasis is really what's killing the tumor cells. And uh, you, you can regard this in a simple way again, the seed and soil. That a tumor, uh, if it's going to spread, it can basically send out these metastatic cells to stick somewhere. But they won't stick unless there is a local inflammation. And the tumor can actually stimulate this inflammation by sending out these interleukin-1 
molecules, which is those that we are blocking. And they will attack what's called inflammatory cells in the tumor, which will stimulate inflammation. So what we can do is to attack these inflammatory cells as well. So it's not only the tumor, because these cells have IL-1 wrap on the surface and are blocked with our antibodies. And in principle it means that we're not no longer sticking to the original numbers when it comes to tumors. We can actually treat all tumors that have these inflammatory cells in the tumor microenvironment. And these numbers have a potential to go up from 25 up to 80 percent up to almost 100 percent. So what we're doing right now is that we are doing this clinical trial. It's a phase one slash two way trial. It's carried out in Norway, Denmark, uh, Holland and Belgium at major hospitals. Uh, we are treating patients in those groups of three patients at a time. Uh, and once we have got three patients in a dose group, we are treated for three weeks. And then we do a safety evaluation. If a safety evaluation looks good, uh, we are allowed to take on three new patients and start treatment. And I often get to question what's happening after three weeks. Well, all patients are treated as long as it's likely that they can respond to the therapy or if, as long as they want to have treatment. So we will not only generate safety data, we will generate some kind of efficacy data as well. And in sum this summer, uh, the plan is that we have treated all patients and we will start a phase two part. And the phase two part will uh, consist of three different cohorts. One cohort where patients with non-small cell lung cancer and pancreatic cancer are continue to be treated with CANO4. One group of patients with non-small cell lung cancer will be started to get combination therapy. And combination therapy is really the way to go. It puts us, gives us an opportunity to get into earlier in the disease, which I think is important. And uh, it's also really the trend. Everyone is trying to go for combination therapies. And we will do the same in pancreatic cancer. So then leaving the cancer field and just comment very quickly on uh, what we're doing in autoimmunity. So IL-1 wrap our target is not only, uh, let's say, a receptor for IL-1 system, it's also a receptor for what's called IL-33 and IL-36. And all these molecules drive, are known to drive certain autoimmune inflammatory diseases. And uh, we have uh, signed a partnership with the US company called Panorama Research Incorporated where we are developing a new antibody blocking all these systems at one time and we will select a clinical candidate for f development uh, early or sometimes next year. So then if we look at our news flow which is ahead of us, uh, we, we have lots of data to come. We have uh, combination therapy data which are currently being generated and which we hope to present as quickly as possible. We will try to explain what's happening in the clinical trial as much as we can. We will present more preclinical studies. But what's really important is the milestone during summer, which is the phase one data. And uh, the phase one data are very important because it's really the starting point for expanding into new indications. But we need safety data and perhaps some early efficacy data to be able to take the next steps and expand these programs. And uh, as soon as we have a phase one data, we do not have to wait for a new protocol. It's already approved and we can start uh, the phase two way part directly. Uh, this tr can food trial is only done in the US. Oh, it's not done in the US, it's only done in Europe. And uh, we need to have implemented a US regulatory strategy because the US is biggest market have uh, FDA needs to be in place in drug development. We need US key opinion leaders to take part in this program. And we are going to, we have started activities here and we are going to communicate once we are ready with the, with the strategies. And of course the application for listing on the main market is very important as well. And then just a 
a few comments on the cancer market. It's growing very rapidly. It passed uh, over 100 billion US in uh, 2015. It's growing at almost 10% per year. It's very much driven by the new immune oncology products, where we are as well. Uh, the major products for cancer treatment already today are different antibodies against different molecules, selling for between 7 and 8 billion, billion US. The new drugs, uh, Optiva and Keytruda, uh, are selling for almost 5 billion uh, during 2017, expected to reach more than 10 billion US very soon. Uh, just a quick comment on our patent. Uh, we have uh, granted patents in hematological cancers uh, that are valid for 2013 uh, for use of IL-1 RAP as a target. In solid tumor it's valid until 2032, granted in most territories. Our product candidate, uh, we also have a patent around uh, which is valid to 2035. And we have uh, patent applications around new antibodies. So I'd like to just finish off with a summary here, so why you should invest in Cantargia or why, why I think it's so interesting. Uh, we are in the fastest growing field of the, and, uh, or the pharmaceutical uh, d development market, the immune oncology. Uh, our lead candidate has very promising activity in uh, early preclinical pre pre studies and a very interesting mechanism of action which is supported by strong data from Novartis. Uh, we have very unique and strong IP in the field. We have a very strong investor base behind us and uh, we have funding for more than two years and we are preparing for listing on main market. And thereby I'm finished and happy to take questions. Thank you Johan. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And also, Cantaglia is in a very interesting phase right now. Um, you were here a few months ago yeah. only. Um, you had, at that point of time, you had just uh, finished a big financing round. Um, you filled up your, your, your war chest, so to speak. <laughs> um, you also attracted a number of uh, heavy institutional uh, investors in that round. Um, would you say that, uh, what, has anything changed uh, since then? Uh, I mean in in sense of um, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the interest in the company, basically. No, but I, I, I feel that there is a major interest in the company and uh, more and more people get to know about us, uh, obviously. Mm. It's a combination of different things. Uh, the strong data from Novartis has really created an interest from the scientific field mm. in this uh, biology. Uh, from an investment po point of investor side, mm. having these strong institutional investors, of course, has uh, created more attention. Mm. And uh, we have continued with, uh, with news flow during this year, both around IP and around new preclinical observations and all these leads to, very, let's say, very positive discussions and I think more and more people are starting to follow us. Mm. And in terms of news flow, the, 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 the news that you just released uh, uh, very recently um, about blocking the, the cancer from spreading, yeah. this is really, really exciting because that's basically a holy grail in, in cancer research, isn't it? No, but absolutely. I, I think uh, the, the estimate is that 90% of all deaths in cancer are caused by this spread of metastases that are very difficult to control. So, of course, if you can attack fundamental pathways in that spread, mm. you, you, you have a much better chance to get good treatment effects. Mm. So, so what we have shown now is that we not only have a direct attack on, on the tumor cells and, and block their activity, we actually can block the way they are spreading as well, mm -hmm. with the same mechanism. So well, that's it's a, it's a good <laughs> position to be in. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nice. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, like I said earlier, it's okay to put your question in Swedish if you want. 
Yes. Have you si uh, seen any side effects uh, from the treatment on this test? So, in, in, uh, so we've done all the safety studies uh, prior to start of clinical trials and we didn't see an anything specific when it comes to safety problems or safety signals there. So it mm -hmm. looks very, very good. Uh, I cannot really comment on, on what we've seen in the, in the clinical trial, except that if we had seen something horrible, we would have been obliged to tell the market. Mm. So, 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 so I think that <laughs> in one way that's, that's respond, uh, it's a response to your question. So in that sense, no news is good news. Absolutely. Yeah. But what, what, what we can say also is that there it, because I think it's a good question about the side effects and we know that the, from the Novartis trial that the mo in general it was very safe but the side effect they observed was uh, an increased risk for infections which is exactly what you would expect because mm. the IL-1 system is, is you can say it's, it's hijacked by the tumor to give a tumor advantage, but the normal function is to protect ourselves from viruses and bacteria. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions there? Uh, so, this this um, this double the combined effect. I think that's really interesting. That you don't really you, you don't only attack the specific tumor cells. But you also attack other cells mm. within the tumor environment. Can you tell us a bit yeah, more so, about so, that? So the, so the tumor is, it's very complex. So a tumor is, consists of much more than just, let's say, cancer cells. It, it contains of something called stroma cells, which give some kind of rigidity to the tumor. There are blood vessels to give uh, nu nutrients to the tumor. And there are also immune cells, and these immune cells are designed to protect the tumors against our Im own immune system. And uh, some of these immune cells overexpress IL-1 RAP, so we can actually kill those immune cells as well, which is a completely new strategy for treating cancer. Mm -hmm. And when we can combine it into in the same product, of course, it's... Mm -hmm. and how much does the world know about this the new approach at this uh, point? <laughs> We're trying to spread the news. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we're here today. As yeah, well. absolutely. And uh, I also think the once you present the data at AECR, I think the scientific community mm. will be m more aware. And what, when is that? In mid-April. Mid-April, okay. Yeah. Um, you will also get more questions from Tobias, our analyst, yep. in a little while. Uh, at this point, we are ready to move on to the program, but we'll thank Jaron with a warm applause. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm here afterwards if you have any questions. Yes, of course. Uh, all the companies will be present after the presentations are done, so you can definitely find them outside in the lounge and grab them and ask your questions. So, our next speaker is... Anders Jönkvist from Rovac, and he will be presenting right now. Welcome, Anders. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning to you all. As mentioned, my name is Anders Jönkvist. I'm a pharmacist by training, and I'm the VD of Rovac. And Rovac is a Scandinavian um, biotech company listed on Aktietorget, which is a multilateral um, trading facility. Um, we were listed in uh, March 2016 uh, and now at a, a price of about 8.30 Swedish kroner. And today <coughs> we are at a price level of around uh, 25 uh, Swedish kroner. So what do we work with? We also work with the immune oncology as the other presenters have, have discussed. But our approach is slightly different. We are using the immune system to fight metastasis. And um, we do that by activating the immune system and activating the T cells in the immune system. So this is a T cell activation. It's not an, uh, it's not an antibody activation. 
to be able to activate these T cells to fight cancer cells, specific cancer cells, we need to give the T cells a target. And the target that we are working with is the protein ROSI. -E. And ROSI -E is interesting from the point of view that it's overexpressed, meaning high concentrations in all cancer cells having a metastatic potential. And this is the way that we can fight metastasis in cancer. This overexpression um, that has been, has been um, um, uh, shown by a number of researchers is across the field of um, metastatic cancer cells, meaning it potentially could be used for a number of different cancer indications. Um, so, why do we think <coughs> that ROSI is very interesting? First of all, when we are trying to find new antigens in our research group, we're always looking at antigens that have a role, a function in the, in the cancer cells. And in relation to ROSI, the role is that it is uh, that it's related to the motility, the, the ability of the cancer cell to move from one site to a, to a different site. This is what, what we are using here. So we can attack, if we can reduce ROSI, the cancer cell cannot move. And in that way we can avoid metastasis. As mentioned before, ROSI is overexpressed in uh, more or less all metastatic cancer cells, again given by very broad uh, indication possibility. Mutations, <coughs> that's often a problem when you're working with cancer, uh, with working with cancer vaccines and the reason for that is that if um, the, the antigen, the, the protein is mutated, you cannot um, target it. But with ROSI, the case is that it very, very seldom mutates. And therefore, what is called immune escape is not likely to happen with this treatment. Then um, the ROSI is by the National Cancer Institute regarded as a prioritized uh, cancer antigen in their research that they did uh, some years back. Now, I think <coughs> all of you know that there has been a number of different cancer vaccines on the market uh, developed and uh, they have not had the big success that, that uh, was expected of this way of treating cancer. So why do we think that we are uh, better and have a better possibility? And first of all, <coughs> we are aiming at treating the cancer at a very early stage, at the time when we have a low tumor burden. Many of the others have waited to treat until late in, a, in a, a cancer development. So this is the first point. Uh, development immune resistance is also a problem with these cancer vaccines. But ROSI is not overexpressed until the uh, cells start to metastasize. And this is in general the same time as the disease is diagnosed. So <clears throat> the body, the immune system have not been um, exposed to the overexpression for a long time at the time when you start treatment and therefore it reduces the risk for, uh, for immune resistance. And finally, <clears throat> if you go back in time you would see that many of the cancer vaccines used what is called short peptides. These are or 8 to 10 amino acid uh, sequences. While we are using long pe peptides, ours is on 20 amino acids. And the long peptides is activating not only the CD8 killer cells, but also the CD4 T cells. And this provides a better immune response than only activating the CD8 cells. So for this reason, we think that <coughs> we have a better possibility in, in reaching a good result with this treatment. Now, working, <coughs> working with this treatment, as I mentioned, in a very early stage, of a disease development. And if we take, for example, prostate cancer progression, you will see uh, in the beginning here, you have the local therapy, and that's this where, at least in Scandinavia, most of the patients will get surgery. Following that surgery, they will not get any treatment. Active monitoring, that is what the patients will receive. What we can do, because the safety profile of the product is very good, we can start treatment already at this early stage of disease development. 
And this, <coughs> uh, the authorities have already accepted that we can do, which um, gives us a new possibility. Other treatments, newer treatment, as you see on this graph, is uh, attacking uh, the cancer at a much later stage um, after the patients have gone through secondary treatment. So we won't like to prevent or at least limit the relapse of cancer. And in doing that, we want to start as early as possible with our treatment. So, the ongoing clinical trial, which is the first in man clinical trial, a phase 1-2 trial in prostate cancer patients. These patients have finalized their uh, initial treatment and are in the, in, the, in the phase where they are observed, but don't get any other treatment. And this is for us a very good thing because then we can see how our product, if there are any side effects with our product, without interference from any other treatment. So what we do is the primary objective of this first clinical trial is obviously, obviously to look at the safety and the tolerability of the cancer vaccine. The secondary treatment is to monitor if the immune response uh, is, is uh, we get the response from the immune um, that we are looking for, that means a vaccine-mediated uh, immune response. That's the second, secondary objective. And then we have an explorative objective where we try to, try to compare the immune response with a PSA le uh, level. And PSA, that's a bioindicator that is used normally in prostate cancer to measure the progress in the, in the, in the cancer. And we also try to assess if we can see any indication of what is called progression-free survival. I shall mention already now that the size of this study is too small to make any conclusions on the explorative uh, objectives. It's more there to present and discuss data. So, the status of this clinical study is that um, the patients are given all in all 11 injections subcutaneously. And uh, in the beginning, we give one injection per second week. And after the first three months, we get one injection per month. We finalized the recruitment um, period for these patients in July last year. And at this point, all patients have finalized the treatment. The last patient uh, did get his last injection the 16th of February. The next step is there to, to take the final blood samples, which will happen um, uh, by the end of this month, maybe very early in April. The safety uh, status right now looks very good. It's an open study, which means that both the doctor and the patient know that what they are going is a one-arm study, so all get the active treatment. So it's easy to review the safety of the product and no safety issues has been uh, encountered, so the study can continue without uh, interruption. As mentioned, we are also measuring the immune response in this study. And the immune response must be measured to, to get robust and reproducible results at the same time. And that will happen in April and quarter two. However, to get the analytical method, which is called interferon gamma elispot, to get that correct, it has to be adapted to the antigen used in this study, our antigen. We did this uh, in, the, in the fall last year, and following this new protocol that had been developed, we decided to test eight patients where we had, where we had sufficient number of uh, lymphocytes uh, to see if the method worked. And results from this, <coughs> Um, analysis is that all patients have received six of the 11 in injections at the time and seven out of the eight patients showed a significant immune response. And this is a very promising result. That is, not often you see such a significant re result and such a significant immune response. And it was also noted that six out of the seven patients uh, responding already get their immune response after four injections, which means approximately six weeks after the treatment has been initiated. And that is fairly early in the process that they're getting this. <clears throat> the, 
These results are very promising, and that's why we decided to to uh, to present them already in December. Um, and uh, it's likely that the results that we will get here by the end of quarter two on the real clinical study will be very similar to the results that we showed uh, last year. It has to be done, obviously. All the patients have to be analyzed. There are 22 patients all, to, uh, all, all in all. Uh, but the results obtained right now is so uh, strong that we believe that the results in April will be, uh, sorry, in, in later second, second quarter will be uh, very, very good. So <clears throat> that's the clinical part, and that's obviously very interesting. Um, and um, another part that is very necessary and interesting also is the regulatory development. When we are working with cancer um, uh, vaccines, there are very few regulatory guidelines that can be used to get guidance how you should develop and what kind of documentation that the authorities need. And therefore, <coughs> we have utilized our SME status, small medium sized enterprise, uh, at EMA to discuss with EMA to in ensure that what we are doing is what the authorities are looking for. So they had the first meeting, <coughs> which was an SME briefing meeting in September, a very positive meeting. And EMA proposed that we go directly to what is called a scientific advice procedure, and that is the preparation for the next clinical study. And uh, we started that procedure in January, had a meeting, a pre-submission meeting, as it is called, in, uh, on the 20th of February. And the procedure is now ongoing, and we expect to get the conclusion of the procedure by the end of April. Except if EMA would like to have a, uh, an additional face-to-face -face meeting, then it will take one more month to get the final uh, conclusion of the procedure. So <clears throat> the regulatory de development is uh, progressing well and, and we are in front, so to say, of what is needed for planning of the next clinical phase. So back to my old development plan <clears throat> that I now have shown since the mid-2015. Uh, and again, <clears throat> we have uh, completed what we have promised uh, to do in our prospectus in uh, 2016. And the only thing missing now uh, from that is, is com completion of the clinical report and the clinical trial, continue the research that is ongoing, and then the planning of the next clinical phase. Um, need to say also that we are on time with this plan and we are on budget with this plan. And that's important information, I think. So the clinical trial is ongoing and on track and the regulatory development is on track. So the focus now is business development. As we have said in our business model, we want to see if we can uh, license the project uh, after we have completed the ongoing clinical trial or maybe uh, sell the company. And that's obviously up for discussion with potential partners, uh, potential uh, parties that are interested in, in our project. So what we do um, in, in uh, the business uh, activities here, we um, in, uh, identify potential um, customers. We contact these customers, give them information and engage with them to, to discuss the possibilities for, for, um, for further development. That is done in one-to-one -one meetings with a given partner or it's done at biopartnering uh, events. And as you could see uh, this morning, we have engaged and hired uh, David Kopman from Kopman Consulting to assist us in the business development. Uh, David has a very good track record and is known by a number of uh, Swedish uh, companies. Now, what are we selling? The business case that we are selling, first of all, we have a good patent protection for this business case, granted in Australia, US, Japan and EU. Uh, in, in Canada, it's still pending. We have a continuation in US ongoing. That means if the US patent law is changed, which is likely, most experts say, we can continue the patent. So it's not a closed patent. So it's a very good patent protection we have uh, up to 2028 in Europe and up to 2032 in US, USA. And for all these markets, there are possible extensions of the patent. 
uh, different from market to market, but up to approximately five years extension is possible. So again, the business case is a very big market. 40 million new cases of cancer every year. It's enormous. Um, the market is valued to be in the area of 100 billion uh, US dollar, so it's an enormous market. If we see specifically on the cancer vaccines, it's evaluated that these um, will have a value in 2022 of 7.5 billion US dollars. Still a very, very, very big market. Again, the business case that we are selling, uh, discussing, is that we already have the development plan for the next three years. And this um, um, development plan is substantiated in that we have discussions with the relevant uh, authorities, we have discussions with key opinion leaders, and uh, with the clinical trial that we are proposing, it will be up to a partner uh, to, to, to say whether this is the way forward. But this will have a quality that if it shows good results, it will be classified as a pivotal study. And that means that after the clinical trial had been finished, it's possible, uh, potentially possible, I would say, to, to go for a submission, a new drug application or a marketing authorization application. That means that there is a possibility to launch the product already around 2022 and not wait for the phase three clinical trials. This is what we have discussed with EMA, uh, and this is the way that we have designed the clinical trial to have that possibility. And the research uh, uh, activities is obviously uh, continuing um, also if a, a new partner will come in. So if we sum up the business case, I think we have a, a, a unique uh, immune oncology product. We have a project that is in a phase one, uh, two uh, development, which will be completed uh, in the second quarter this year. We have a development project that is on track from a timing point of view and from a budget, budget point of view. There is a very interesting global market. We have a good patent protection and we currently are discussing with potential investors and partners, and I should underline we are discussing, we are not negotiating at this time. It's too early yet. So I think with these words, I would like to thank, say thank you for your time and um, see if we have a person that would ask me some questions. <laughs> thank you very much. In the meantime, why this rush, why this haste with selling the company when you're on to something that interesting? Yeah. Um, the reason uh, for that is that we, first of all, have promised the uh, investor to do that. That was part of the original plan and we would like to keep our promises. Um, from a, a, a purely a financial point of view, I agree with you that there may be an upside that could be interesting. But if we should change the strategy, I think that needs more discussions also with the investors before we do that. We also have to remember that with all development of products, there is a risk. Um, uh, projects fail in phase two and in phase three. So uh, maybe the investors um, would like to see uh, uh, an, an, an exit uh, already at this point. However, we also say in our business model that uh, the board will evaluate if the value can be built a better way in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the project. And this will obviously in the negotiations that we have with partners uh, forward looking have to be evaluated. If a deal um, is better uh, not selling and uh, not licensing it all at this point, we have to discuss it with the investor. But the goal, the first priority, is as we have promised the investor to go for, for, for sale. That's the reason why. That was a very good first question. It is. I was about to ask it myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, actually, speaking about licensing, uh, you, you actually today came out with a press release that you have contracted a um, consultant specialized in finding partners, yeah. basically. 
Could you tell us a bit about the, the plan? Yeah. Well, <coughs> we already started the business development, active business development in September uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And we waited until September because we needed some clinical results and cl clinical progress before we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, we need more um, energy, we need more resources to do the business development. And uh, we decided then to, to uh, engage with a person that have a good uh, track record mm -hmm. instead of building it inside the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's when the name uh, David Kaltman came up. He has a good track record. Mm. Um, uh, also here in Scandinavia, where he has assisted other companies with, with uh, different deals. Uh, so that's the reason why we did that, just simply uh, strengthen mm. our uh, business development activities. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you are, you are looking forward to fairly soon uh, very interesting um, trial results yeah. and uh, but of course this uh, the, the business development work has to be initiated and be ongoing mm -hmm. as, as to speak and one would be very curious then as to knowing something about the interest that you have perceived so far from potential partners is there is there anything you can tell us about that yes as mentioned we are not in negotiations so i can tell you more general uh, what the responses are mm -hmm. and and um, as with, I think, the majority of big pharma company, the big ten, so to say, mm. uh, they, they are very interested mm. uh, because it's a different approach. But as a big company with a big bag of money, they also say, I want to see the clinical data before we go, go on with the negotiations or mm. discussions. And that's uh, the general answer. Mm. Uh, I think the most interesting response we get is that we are focused on, on avoiding relapse mm. of a disease. And that's not many other projects that have done that. No. And as you see, the far majority of cancer patients die from the relapse, from metastasis, and not from the primary tumor. And it's a lo logical approach to, to look at that specifically. Mm -hmm. It has been difficult for some other projects uh, due to the side effects in generally with uh, a number of the cancer treatments. But we have with this cancer vaccine a treatment with very, very good tolerability and basically no relevant uh, side effects. So therefore you have the possibility to start a treatment very early mm. uh, as an adjuvant treatment. I think that's uh, what's interesting a number of other companies. Mm. You will be asked more questions about this, I'm sure, by Tobias, our analyst, mm. in a few moments. Um, as for now, I thank you very much for coming and presenting to us today. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. And that leads us to uh, our final presentation for today. Uh, I will introduce to you Per Nolén from Alligator Bioscience, a um, company based in Lund, who actually have benefited from working with the same person that uh, Robak now has contracted. So, exciting. Welcome, Per. Thank you. Let's start with the bad news. You all got cancer. The good news is you also got an immune system, and that's usually quite capable of preventing those cancer cells from growing in your bodies. Sometimes it's not enough, and that's where immune oncology comes into play. It's been extremely successful. It will save millions of lives. Still, in the end, almost a third of us will die from cancer, unless therapy improves further, and that's what Alligator is here to do. We are developing the next generation immune oncology agents, tumor-directed immunotherapies. This is drugs that more activate the relevant part of the immune system rather than general immune activation. All with a point to actually focus immune attack towards the tumors and to reduce systemic side effects. Here we are pioneers. We have a pipeline of four antibody-based products within that niche, within preclinical and clinical development. And the quality of that pipeline has been validated by the deal with Johnson & Johnson the world's largest healthcare company. 
Based on the upfront payment from that deal, milestones and also successful share issue at our IPO in 2016, we today also have a very sound financial situation with money in the bank for the next three years. Our success factors are twofold. On the one hand, we have a very strong technology platform. We have all the technologies internally we need to develop the next generation bi-specific antibody-based products. The other factor is a strong R&D environment. Of the 50 people at Alligator, 43 are within R&D, two-thirds have a PhD and long experience in immune oncology. We were founded based on this technology, FIND Protein Evolution Technology, in 2001. Many of those people are still in the company. But the most important factor here is a strategic decision taken in 2008, where Alligator decided to start immune oncology. This is about five years before immune oncology was generally accepted. That's why we today stay with a pipeline that's extremely competitive on a global perspective. 1013 was out licensed to Johnson & Johnson in 2015. In 2016, 1015, a first-in-class product, entered preclinical development. And last year, two more products, 1017 and 527, entered preclinical development. And all of them are with immune oncology. Immune oncology is extremely successful and is also reflected in sales. Here, from the first approval in 2011, first it was quite slow due to the side effects. Then in 2015 it was taking up speed, the PD-1 blockers entering the market. One inter interesting factor here, in 2015 still the sales were almost exclusively in malignant melanoma. And that's important because malignant melanoma is around 1% of the mortality in cancer. Then in 2015, it was also approved in lung cancer. And that's the reason for the increase in sales. In 2016, 2017, it's around twice that amount. And within the next five to seven years, it will be between 30 and 50 billion US dollars alone. Here, we are strongly differentiated. Alligator are developing tumor-directed immunotherapies. What's approved today is general immune activators. They activate the full immune system, extremely effective, but also quite toxic, due to the fact that overactivation of the immune system may lead to a a a attack on normal tissue around elsewhere in the body. What we do is a more selective activation of the relevant part of the immune system. So we try to activate the immune system in the actual tumor area. And we have a number of different concepts to do that. And one very particular concept is to engineer bispecific antibodies. Those antibodies can be made up from two different therapeutic antibodies, <coughs> one with an immune activating entity and one with a tumor targeting entity. We fuse those into one super compound that can be injected in the circulation and will actually circulate throughout the system until it reaches the tumor where the tumor targeting antibody will make it stay. So it will accumulate in the tumor area and activate the immune system where it should. The other factor we've done is to engineer that antibody so it's inactive while circulating. It actually won't activate the immune system until the binding to the tumor. So the binding to the tumor is a trigger to activate the other part of the molecule, which is the immune activating part. And I'll come back to that. We have a strong pipeline within this niche. 1013 in clinical phase one, partnered with Johnson & Johnson, Janssen Biotech. 1015 is a first-in-class product. Here we are first in the world with this product and it entered clinical phase one this year. And then two more products on the 41BB target. They are entering clinical trials next year. So let's take a look and start with 1013. Here is an attempt to describe the mechanism of action. And it's in one way extremely complicated, but it's also quite simple. So 1013 activates CD40 as a receptor on antigen-presenting cells. Immune system has essentially only two different parts. One is a part telling the immune system what to attack. It's like a billboard. 
and that's the antigen presenting cells. And the other part is the police function. They execute the attack, and that's the T cells. And immune oncology is the interplay between those two cell types. The antigen presenting cells will show what to attack. The billboard will show the tumor antigen on the surface. Then if we add 1013 activating CD40, that will make the billboard light up and much more clearly show the message. This is a non-self foreign agent that should be attacked. So if we look at that communication in more detail, antigen presenting cells, T cells, and this is the interplay between those two cell types. Here, the tumor part is demonstrated to the T cell. The T cell will recognize this part and get the message, this is a non-self, it should be attacked. But the T cell will put a control question. Is it dangerous? And that question is answered by all those different modulating signals. The red signals tells the T cell it's not dangerous. And that will terminate the attack, there will be no attack. This is the same signals that the tumor used to escape the immune system. So the tumor will be detected by the immune system, but it will also send a signal, well, I might be non-self, but I'm not dangerous, and there will be no immune attack. We must block those signals. Here you have PD-1 blockers, CTLA-4 blockers, already approved on the market. The other kind of signals tells the T cell that it is dangerous and they should execute an attack. That's the green signals, and there will be an immediate immune activation. We have a focus on the green signals, but we actually work with both today. CD40 is unique in one aspect. If you look at those signals, those receptors, actually all those targets are in clinical development today, many in quite late clinical stage, and some on the market like PD-1, CTLA-4, but all of them are directed towards the T cell to activate the T cell, which is a police function. There's only one signal specific for the antigen presenting cell, and that is CD40. It's not better than activating the T cells, but it's a complement. So you can activate both populations and get a stronger total effect. That's why a potential for synergy and combination therapy. And immune oncology will be combination therapy going forward. Competition, yes quite a lot, and this is not even a complete figure. What we have done here is to actually take away all the PD-1 compounds that are not in phase three, and there are about 20, 25 more such compounds here. Every large company will have their own PD-1 in a few years. But if we look at the other targets, CD40 is one of the key targets. We have five competing companies here. We have benchmarked quite extensively. And to make it quite simple, the two strongest antibodies are the alligator compound and the Roche compound. But there is one key difference. We have made our compound tumor directed, meaning that it is more active in the tumor area. And we have also been able to demonstrate that we have a much better toxicity profile. And this was actually the data that convinced Johnson & Johnson to in-license a project in 2015 and it now seems to be confirmed in clinical trials. We have completed one clinical trial that was run by Alligator. It was completed in 2017. We had 24 patients enrolled, five clinical sites, Sweden, Denmark, UK. And essentially it confirmed what we were out for to demonstrate that we have safe and good tolerability at clinically relevant doses, which is very important to the target CD40 because of the fact that Roche has had an immense problems with toxicity. This is not the key phase one study, however, because we did a dose escalation by injecting into the tumors. And Johnson & Johnson then started a second phase one trial by injecting directly into the circulation. And that's still ongoing. In November, they had uh, dosed more than 50 patients and they've continued dosing since. They are planning for expansions as a monotherapy, but they also, as we communicated a few months ago in January, they will also start now combinations with PD-1 and start first looking at safety and then expanding to the efficacy. And just a comment that Johnson & Johnson through Janssen Biotech are now running all future clinical development. 
So we cannot give forward-looking statements on that product anymore. Then to our next internal pro program, 1015. As I said, we are first in the world with this product. Immune oncology will be combination therapy going forward. Here we have a combination therapy in one molecule. It's made up of an OX40 targeting antibody fused to a CTLA-4 blocking antibody. This was the first target approved in immune oncology. And it's designed actually to be combined further with PD-1. It's actually designed specifically to add what PD-1 is lacking. So PD-1, extremely good at activating the immune system, but then you have suppressive mechanism to avoid overactivation. That will also be called so-called regulatory cells, reducing the immune activation. And CTLA-4 and OX40 specifically take away those control mechanisms, regulatory cells. And that's why probably CTLA-4 today is still the only target that has demonstrated clinical synergy with PD-1. That's well documented, extremely effective together with PD-1, but also extremely toxic. And what we have made here again is a tumor-directed compound. We will actually direct the CTLA-4 blockade to the tumor area through this compound. And we have quite nice data to demonstrate that today. But it's not only actually activating two different immune pathways. They're also put together in one molecule, and that adds another dimension. I tell you why. What we can do by having them in the same molecule is actually physically attach immune cells to each other and increase cell-to-cell -cell communication. And we have demonstrated that quite clearly, 1015 will make increased cell-to-cell -cell crosstalk between CTLA-4 and OX40 expressing cells. This is just to demonstrate that it happens, but the next slide is important. It shows it has very strong synergy. This is a key mechanism of action. It's to take away the suppressive mechanisms of the immune system, the regulatory T cells. And just to make it sh short, the blue line is by uh, acti giving both OX40 and CTLA-4 antibodies. Then you can give a quite good effect. But 1015, where you have those targeted in the same molecule, the effect is three to four fold better. And it's also reflected in actual efficacy. Here is a tumor model, bladder cancer. Treating with 1015 will cure about 65% of the mice in this therapy. That's very impressive, but the most impressive fact about immune oncology is the fact that those mice that are cured, they will remain protected against the tumor. They will be immune for the rest of their lives probably. We have demonstrated that many times, and they're always immune. In this, on the right-hand side, we have taken it one step further. Here, we have cured the mice from a bladder cancer, waited two months, no further treatment, and then we re-challenge with the bladder cancer and a completely different cancer, in this case, a pancreatic cancer. The immune system will not recognize the pancreatic cancer, and it will grow quickly and eventually kill the mice. But the immune system will remember the bladder cancer and the cancer cells are immediately killed off by the immune system. And that is the beauty about immune oncology and why the patients continue to live year after year once the immune system had the, the better part of it. Here it's what looks like a dull slide, but it's actually the most important. What we do here is take the tumors from the mouse that were treated and then we look at the immune activation in the tumors. We can increase immune activation. This is immune cells by X40, by CTLA-4, but as you can see, 1015 is far, far better. But the very most important part is on the right-hand side. The fact that in other immune organs, this is a spleen, there is no activity at all. So we have actually been able to focus the immune activation to the tumor with no activation in the rest of the body. And if we can confirm that in the clinic, we have a blockbuster potential. Basically, we already know today that PD-1 and CTLA-4 is synergistic. 
despite the tremendous toxicity of CTLA-4 from ipilimumab, it's still selling for about $1 billion a year, even if most patients can't tolerate the combination. If we can demonstrate that we have CTLA-4 block without the toxicity, we have an absolute blockbuster product. And that's only melanoma today. It's now tested in lung cancer as well, and in renal cancer it's already proved. But this is probably our most important asset, and it enters clinical trials later this year in the autumn. Just a few words on our other, our other products. 1017 is a 41BB targeting antibody. 41BB is a quite important T cell activating receptor. And here we have developed the best in class product. Essentially, 41BB is associated with quite severe toxicity as well. Again, we have made an antibody which is tumor directed, more active in the tumor area, and we hope to come around that problem with the toxicity and have a strong 4-1-BB effect without toxicity. We have competitors, BMS and Pfizer, they are already in phase one, but we think we have a better product and we will enter <coughs> clinical phase one in cancer patients next year. And then we've taken it one step further in the next product. 527 is a co-development program, 50-50 co-development with Aptivo Therapeutics in US. We have a bispecific product binding both to the tumor cells and activating the immune system. And here we have a product that can circulate inactively in the body until it reaches the tumor and then it will accumulate in the tumor and activate the immune system there and only there. So let's go on to the financial situation. Very briefly, we had at the end of the last year 67 million US dollars, around a bit more than 500 million Swedish kronas in the bank. And the burn rate last year was 120 million Swedish. Cost will increase, but even with a growing pipeline and increasing costs, we, that will take Alligator at least three years ahead, even if we shouldn't receive any more milestones. And we do expect more milestones next year. On the shareholder list, there has been a few changes. Still the largest owner, Bank International Luxembourg. We have Johnson & Johnson and we have Sunstone. But as you can see, Duba, the investor-owned Duba, has sold off all their shares over the last six months, about almost five million shares. A quite significant part has been taken up by US healthcare specialists. It's not Goldman Sachs, it's under their name, but they're not public with their asset yet. Uh, and then the other part has been taken up also actually by a German healthcare specialist. So all in all, we have a very strong shareholder list. One more point is the management team with a growing pipeline and a growing company. We have also increased the management team and added one head of discovery <coughs> to take care of our early investments in new products. And also we have recruited a new chief medical officer, Charlotte Russell who is heading our clinical development. And starting in one month, we also have a head of business development joining, Anno Daram from AstraZeneca. So I'd just like to conclude with a final slide. We are today building a solid clinical pipeline at Alligator. 1013 is in late phase one. 1015, we're first in the world with this bispecific dual immune activator, will enter clinical phase one in cancer patients in the autumn. And next year, two more products, but all with the first in class potential, will enter clinical phase one trials in cancer patients. And with that, we are well on our way to establish Alligator as a key player within our niche of immune oncology, tumor directed immunotherapy. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Very interesting to hear. Um, I find it particularly interesting that you're here today being one of uh, quite few actually Swedish companies who have license, licensing deals in place. Yep. Um, how did that change your companies? It has changed a lot. Uh, I think like most biotech companies we spent the first 15 years uh, begging for money every year and uh, while that worked quite well, we did actually develop 1013, but uh, also it made it more difficult to make long-term investments and uh, to build on completely new concepts. Mm -hmm. I think uh, by that uh, we have gotten first credibility, both 
locally and internationally. Uh, they know we can develop high quality drug compounds, but also a very stable financial situation. Mm. So it's uh, all for the better, I would say. Yeah. And having this established partnership, uh, does it also attract um, other companies to you as well as, as far as being contacted by others who want to know what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it is quite difficult to establish US collaborations without uh, having uh, something real uh, behind you. And I think that uh, agreement with Johnson Johnson that uh, was instrumental for the Aptivo deal as well, or mm -hmm. deal, it's a co-development program, but mm -hmm. uh, we, are, we are there, we are discussing on equal terms with the US companies today. Mm -hmm. And you were saying earlier, um, as far as the financing go, you have a you're well financed, one should say. Yeah. Um, being in a partnership where potential milestones coming in, does this mean that from an investor point of view, you're kind of immune against the the, the et et eternal fear of of new share issues? In a way, I mean, as long as the programs develop according to plan, we are immune mm. with the. Uh, expected uh, milestones from 1013. We will not have to make uh, f further share issues. But uh, I mean, as a company, we're planning it on the safe side. So we assume that we will have n no more milestones and we still then will have at least three years uh, spending. But obviously, mm. we expect milestones already next year. So mm. it's a good situation to be in. It's a good situation indeed. And counting from the the point where you were introduced to the, to the uh, Swedish stock market, um, being, uh, becoming a public company. Um, you've been working with your development programs, mm. you've expanded your pipeline, and at the same time, in parallel, the, the actual uh, stock price, <laughs> if I look at back at the curve, doesn't look so funny. I mean, obviously you might not want to comment on the, on the no, sure. share I think, price. I but think it's a valid question. And, yeah. uh, I would say it, it does not reflect any issues with the pipeline. So we yeah. have actually been more successful the last few years than ever before. Yeah. We have delivered on all we said we would deliver on in our IPO. Mm. But we should also remember that at the IPO there were people who has invested in Alligator for the last 15 years. And uh, at that time they actually made a very good return on their investment. Mm. So I think there has been uh, pressure from s old owners selling. Mm. Uh, I hopefully we have seen the end of that now, but yeah. uh, that's uh, the explanation I can give. Yeah. yeah. So this is a point where the where the the graph goes up again, perhaps. <laughs> Start. That's what we all hope for. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? In Swedish, is okay if you want. You have mm? you have said it all. So. <laughs> Uh, you will get questions though from uh, Tobias, our mm -hmm. analyst, in a few moments. But um, for this time, I thank you very much for coming. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, I will actually turn to Swedish now in a few moments. Uh, we have. Um, a few more things to say before we quit, but that will be for the Swedish audience. So thank you, American viewers, for this time. Uh, och ni som sitter kvar här, jag tänkte lite snabbt bara ge ett uh, tips. Uh, när man tittar på bolag inom biotech och läkemedelsutveckling så är ju så att säga, situationen lite speciell. Bolag befinner sig i olika utvecklingsfaser. Uh, det kan ibland vara lite krångligt att veta hur man ska värdera olika bolag. Eh, vi på Biostock har utvecklat ett litet verktyg som vi hoppas ska kunna hjälpa eh, investerare att göra lite jämförelse och, och eh, vi kallar det för Biostock börsbevakning. Eh, syns här på skärmen bakom mig. Eh, vi håller på att eh, vi kommer att trycka på knappen och släppa ut det här nu som en eh, beta version av det här verktyget, vilket då innebär att det fortfarande är under fin slipning och så vidare. Men några av de saker man kommer att kunna titta på här, det är i alla fall att man kan titta på alla börsnoterade svenska life science-bolag uppdelat per vilken, vilken utvecklingsfas de befinner sig i, preklinik, fas 1 och så vidare. Man kommer att kunna göra jämförelser, man kommer lätt att kunna titta på vilka bolag som går bäst under givna tidsperioder. Man kan välja mellan dag, vecka, månad och kvartal och så vidare. 
och se vilka som har utvecklats bäst respektive sämst under dem. Eh, och vad man dessutom kommer kunna göra, om jag kan scrolla, det kan jag. Man kommer kunna följa nyhetsflöden. Det har vi också utvecklat en app som man kan göra om man vill följa nyhetsflödet i sin mobil. Eh, men man kommer också kunna titta på varje specifikt bolag och titta på lite grann utvecklingen, hur de har gått, vad de har för generellt investerarbetyg. Och det där är ju lite spännande. Eh, det är alltså en formel som utgår från en mix av vad som skrivs om bolagen på diverse aktieforum och så vidare samt lite grann utveckling på vad det gäller antal aktieägare i bolaget under en given tidsperiod. Eh, man kommer enkelt att kunna jämföra bolagen utifrån värdering och se. Kanske blir lättare att hitta de där undervärderade. Titta här är en stackare som har noll i bolagsvärde. Det är, som sagt, det är ett beta. En beta-version här. Eh, och som ni ser här uppe så ligger det också en del intressanta parametrar som fortfarande inte är aktiverade. Men eh, det är något som vi jobbar på finslipa nu för det är naturligtvis viktigt att man släpper ut korrekta siffror när man gör en sån här sak. Så jag skulle rekommendera alla som är intresserade av den här sektorn att gå in på borsbevakning.biostock.se. Där kan man anmäla sig som betatestare och då kommer man att få ett mejl med möjligheten att sen då logga in och komma åt alla uppgifter som finns här. Och som sagt, en betaversion är en tidig version. Vi uppmuntrar alla som provar det här verktyget att skicka in alla eventuella felaktigheter eller konstigheter som ni upptäcker. Det blir vi inte ledsna för tvärtom. För tanken är att vi ska slipa vidare på det här, att det ska bli ett riktigt vast verktyg som man kan använda för att hitta guldkornen helt enkelt och motsatserna kanske. Så, en fråga. fråga. Ja, varsågod. Börsvärde. Ja. Är det, finns det någon notering om på börsvärdet om det är bara om det finns aktier i bolaget som inte är noterade? Det där brukar ju förvilla ibland. Ja, nej, i det här läget så gör du inte. Alltså man ser rent eh, vad det gäller uppdatering när det görs nya emissioner och så, där, så är det något som kommer att ske löpande. Ja, ja, men, men om du säger att... Är det som inte är noterat, nej, den, den parametern... Det liksom mm. när man tittar på olika ja. relationer. Nej, man, får, man får se det här för vad det är. Ett sätt att grovt jämföra. Så att, ja, möjligt att det kommer i en senare version. Vi tar naturligtvis gärna emot alla eventuella idéer på vidare utveckling. Att ta med det Ja, precis. Yes. Någon annan som har någon fråga om det? Om inte, ja, du har den. Framtid kräva att man eh, registrerar sig eller kommer att ligga öppet på internet? Eh, jag skulle säga så här att i nuläget så kan man registrera sig eh, och komma in och det kostar ingenting eller så. Eh, framåt får vi se, det beror på lite hur mycket vi utvecklar det och vilka funktioner man får. Jag menar, gör vi det tillräckligt bra så kanske det är någonting som man tycker är värt att betala en slant för. I nuläget är det dock helt gratis. De enda som betalar det är vi. Som utvecklare. Ja, det är bra så. Hörni, stort tack för att ni kom idag. Och eh, ni är varmt välkomna ut i lunchen och ta någonting att eh, äta på, dricka och eh, se om ni kan hitta bolagsvidén. De har eh, de här små nam namnlapparna så att ni kan hugga dem och ställa frågor om ni har. Och eh, jag kan passa på att säga också att vi kör ett event i Lund den 18 april om någon råkar befinna sig i Skåne då. Så är ni varmt välkomna. Men det kommer vi att skicka ut mer information om sen. Tack så jättemycket för idag.